Hi everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful day or evening, depending on when you are watching this. I'm Kalita Shadrach. I am currently a lecturer in Archaeology and Heritage Studies at Seoul Clyke University in the Northern Cape Province. I'm also a PhD candidate in Archaeology at the University of the Witwatersrand. So I have a few degrees prior to my PhD and during the course of those studies I've had to do many an abstract. So, um, today we're going to be looking at how to write abstracts, perhaps if you're not familiar with them, perhaps if you're struggling with abstract writing, it is something that certainly will be able to help you. I would like to thank the Southern African Archaeological Student Council and Society for the invitation, of course, to present this topic. I think it can be a very fun topic because it's associated with some very uh, exciting events such as potentially going to conferences, workshops or submitting uh, a thesis dissertation or application for funding and grants. So without further ado, let's move on to this uh, hopefully exciting presentation. So there are six major sections to this presentation that we're really going to be looking at in depth. The first is, what is an abstract? I'm going to present you with an actual dictionary definition of an abstract, and then we're going to unpack it very much within the context of the academic environment, which most of you uh, listening to this, of course, fall within. So what is an abstract literally by definition, but also practically? How do we apply an abstract? Secondly, we're going to look at when is an abstract required? So abstracts certainly do represent uh, typically something that uh, you apply for. So you want to go to a certain event, you want to potentially travel to a certain conference in a certain region, um, or you would like to engage with a different uh, academics and academic circles in the form of workshops or um, just networking in general. Next, we're going to look at the goals of an abstract. So there's, of course, a major purpose of an abstract. Um, it's meant to allow you to do um, something. Typically, it's associated with, of course, um, allowing you to really share your current research, your past research, your interests, and also, most importantly, really highlights the positives uh, and the boundaries that your research potentially is pushing within the discipline. Then we're going to look at the contents of an abstract. So how do we break it down? What elements of an abstract exist and why are they significant? We're then going to look at very briefly the formatting of an abstract. This is very much associated simply with what does an abstract need uh, formatting wise uh, in order for it to meet the requirements generally of uh, academic standards. Lastly, I'm going to introduce you, uh, we won't unpack the readings, but I'll provide you, of course, with two really key readings if you would like to uh, read an academic publication on how to do abstract writing. So in that sense, it is a little bit weird because you have to write, read an academic reading to understand how to do abstract writing, but I think it's something that perhaps some of you might identify with very strongly in the sense that you understand the wording, you understand what is being asked of you, and you get a much more thorough explanation of the various different elements that we're going to be doing today. So firstly, what is the definition of an abstract? If you think it's a little bit weird that I've included this as one of the slides, 
I think it's uh, something that should apply to all of us. Sometimes we use terms, particularly in archaeology, heritage studies, or academia in general, that we don't necessarily understand. So abstract is one of those terms which can be used for a range of different reasons. Uh, most often, I think, in uh, the real world, so outside academia is what I call the real world, um, Abstract can be used to describe something that is ominous or something that is not um, clear. So, for example, you have abstract art or abstract ideas, thoughts. Um, I wanted to give you the actual definition of the term abstract with regard to writing. So, by definition, it is according to Oxford Dictionaries, of course, it is a summary of the contents of a book, article, or speech. Now, we know because we're working within the academic environment, what we're really looking at is the summary or condensing of your research project or uh, your research in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be your honours, masters, or PhD. You may be working on side projects, or you may have already um, completed some of those degrees. So we're looking at a summary of content and information. Some similar words include synopsis, or synopses, um, resume, outline, abridgment, condensation, or summation. Okay, so it's really overall just a small paragraph that allows the reader to not only know what your research is about, but really understand the significance of, of it as well. So now that we know, according to dictionary definition, what an abstract is, let's move on to what it really means in an academic environment. How do we break it down into bite-sized pieces for us to hopefully submit an exceptional abstract in the future? Okay, so very importantly, an abstract is original work. So you're in the academic environment, you know how significant original material is. Um, plagiarism is something on every level within academia that is unacceptable. And certainly that goes for abstract writing as well. You must make sure that you yourself have written your abstract. Perhaps your supervisors or colleagues can aid you in advice, in perhaps sentence structure, sentence formatting, punctuation, etc. But ultimately, you are responsible for producing your own content. And that is the most important thing, that you're producing original work. In fact, what you might find is this is very easy because if you are in postgrad, for example, you will have already gone through the process or are in the process of proposal writing. Most universities or most, um, shall we say, uh, tertiary institutions provide you with a guideline for your proposal and projects. Very similarly, that guideline applies to the abstract as well. So a guideline will suggest that you include things such as an introduction or a rationale, which means why is this research important? What gap in the natural sciences, social sciences, or the discipline in general, is your research contributing to? Um, your guideline for your proposal writing or thesis dissertation writing will further break down into sections that include things such as what is your methodology? What are your proposed outcomes? So you may very well already have a breakdown of the important aspects of research and your projects. All you have to do is take those major guidelines or headings and apply them to a shorter, condensed version of your project. Not to worry if you're a bit panicked, a little bit confused. We're going to be going through how you approach uh, writing your abstracts. An abstract must be fully self-contained and make sense by itself. 
Ultimately, when it comes to potentially conferences, workshops, uh, guest lecturing, or uh, guest speaking, what you will find is that an abstract fully represents your research and yourself. So it must be tied all together very carefully. It must have relevant information and important information. You don't want to be including um, information that isn't significant because ultimately that space you've lost in your abstract that could have gone towards really major significant points. So your abstract as a whole represents your research and thus you must make sure if every element of it is meant to be there and conveys a certain point strongly. When we look at abstracts, we don't really want to see too much referencing. Now, that might be quite shocking, understandably, but as I mentioned, an abstract is really pulling your research together. Within your actual research uh, paper or research thesis, dissertation, whatever it may be, you of course have a lot more information. So you have information regarding um, where you're working, why you're working on it, how you're going to be doing it. So you're able to draw it out quite extensively in larger documents. In an abstract, however, you don't have the um, option of putting in 10 different references and um, very much writing your abstract like you would an academic piece of work. Instead, an abstract in and of itself should be your own words with very limited references, so sourcing other people's information, and it should highlight key content areas, the purpose of your research, the relevance or importance of your work, and of course, again, the main outcomes of your research. So there are various type of abstracts that exist for different disciplines and different contexts. We're specifically looking at, at an academic environment. So there are two major types of abstracts you're going to be uh, confronted with or potentially create yourself. The first is a descriptive abstract and the second is an informative abstract. So I myself tend to fall very much in the midline here. Sometimes I can uh, develop a very descriptive abstract, especially if I have a very short word limit, but a more informative abstract is really aided by higher word limits. So not to worry, we're going to unpack word limits and the sort of regulations or guidelines you need to adhere to. So what is a descriptive abstract? Well, descriptive abstracts describe the work being abstracted. So I promise you, I did not put that in to confuse you. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be describing a lot or using a lot of descriptive terminology to con convey your project or research across. Um, descriptive abstracts are more uh, like an outline of the work and are usually very short. So a very quick summary of uh, the work you're doing, the location you're working in, perhaps the significance of it, um, but you're unlikely to unpack methods very well or unpack your outcomes uh, quite extensively. So it's a very quick summative type of abstract. Informative abstract, of course, is what we all hope for and aim for. It's where you're able to provide a lot of detail and convey a lot of important points to your audience or reader. Informative abstracts act as substitutes for the actual papers, uh, research, dissertation, or thesis that you may be unpacking. Key arguments and conclusions are typically presented in this type of abstract. Specifically, the context and importance of the research is emphasized. Reasons for methods and your methodology in general are unpacked quite extensively. And the principal results and conclusions are presented in this abstract. So you really get into the nitty gritty of 
what your data says and what conclusions or broader insights you can unpack. What's really important is when we're looking at these two types of abstracts, often it is the word limits that dictate which abstract you're going to lean towards. If you get, um, so whether it be a conference, a workshop, a grant application, sometimes you're only allowed a certain amount of words. My advice to you is, of course, to go online to the various organization and download what will often be an application or guideline instructions. That will tell you exactly how many words you're allowed, um, sort of if you need keywords as well presented, if you need a title. Um, it may also tell you that potentially your research abstract is between 150 to 300 words. This now means that you're able to include far more information than you originally um, would have been able to in a more descriptive abstract. So just a reminder, guidelines are everywhere and can be found everywhere. The first option, as mentioned in a few slides earlier, you should cons consider speaking to your lecturer, colleagues, or just institution, which generally have academic writing guidelines available for you. Secondly, if you're working with, say, an uh, outside institution, so you're applying to a conference somewhere else, or you're applying to funding for funding apologies um, through a certain organization, you're more than welcome to offer ask them and say, what are your guidelines? I want to meet your expectations as accurately as possible. Or, of course, you can just use this presentation. Okay, so when is an abstract required? One does not simply just write an abstract for fun. I say that only because abstract writing is not the most fun thing to do. In fact, it can be a very um, intense attempt at condensing a lot of information. So you must be very calm and give yourself enough time to write an abstract. It may seem very straightforward, but trying to summarize major points, particularly in academic writing, um, is very difficult. You need to be able to make sure that each word you use is necessary ultimately. But what are some of the reasons we write these very easy or difficult abstracts? Well, the first and most common, of course, is applying for research grants. I say the first and most common, particularly with regards to students and students going through the academic process, potentially into postgrad as well. Applying for research grants is absolutely significant. An abstract really presents the individuals within an organization a clear overview of what they can ex expect in your application. It is the first impression, ultimately, that you will be giving of not only yourself as someone or a student researcher that should be invested in, but also your research why should your research be invested in? So really, it is the first impression. Most um, organizations or sponsors will be looking at. In an application form itself, it'll be the first aspect of the application form that needs to be completed. Okay. Apologies about my spelling in the second point. It's meant to say conference and workshop applications. So this is very exciting because you're, of course, a part of SDW. So you're a part of a workshop already. You may have been required to submit um, sort of a letter of motivation or an application of some form. Uh, you may not only have had to do this for SDW, but perhaps other workshops, but really it's what conveys to organizers that this person and this research is very interesting. We think it would meet the standards of our event or um, 
whatever is being organized ultimately. So again, very important first impression. What's important with regards to conferences and workshops is that your abstract goes beyond these sort of superficial impressions. It also allows organizers to determine which theme category or grouping your research falls within so that it can be associated with similar research. It also allows readers, whether it be the audience or potential colleagues um, within the academic community, it provides them with the opportunity to really see which talks they would like to go to, which people they would like to affiliate with, and it provides a good point of reference for not only yourself, but all members involved within the workshop and all attendees involved in the workshop or conference as well. So if you are within the postgraduate realm, then you certainly know abstracts are absolutely important for submitting research papers to an academic journal. So publication writing is something that very much excuse me, <coughs> apologies, is very much associated with um, publications. So when you write a publication or when you read a publication, the first thing I think all of us gravitate towards is the abstract. Why? Well, we know the abstract provides significant information. It provides the goals of the research, the regional context of the research. It provides us with key information so that we can determine um, if this, when I say we, apologies, I mean uh, publication uh, individuals or moderators would consider that this fits the quality assurance associated with the publication. It fits the themes covered by the publication. Um, of course, it also goes through things such as peer review. So it really does have to be a strong abstract for it to encompass all the major, abs uh, all the major aspects of one's research. One would also require an abstract with regards to writing a book chapter or research proposal, very similar to that process of publication, and ultimately completing a dissertation or thesis. One of the major aspects of uh, writing a thesis or dissertation is towards the end you get the opportunity to finally write your abstract. The reason you typically wait towards the end of your academic writing is because that's when you have all the information. You have the complete picture of what you've been doing, why you've been doing it, and ultimately what you have to show for it. So abstracts always included in a thesis or dissertation and is something that, um, again, to your examiners, uh, to your colleagues, your supervisors potentially, shows your understanding of your research and what you consider important or significant. So what does your abstract represent? I wanted to just give you a nice breakdown of why abstracts are so important, and it goes beyond just the academic realm. Abstracts allow for concise and direct communication. They allow readers who may be interested in the paper to quickly decide whether it is relevant to their purposes and interests. The second uh, major point of what an abstract represents, I would consider goals and research interests, your own goals and research interests. How are you positioning yourselves within academia or within just research in general? Um, really, this is a reflection of where you see yourself going and what you see yourself specializing in. Abstracts provide insight into your research field and the goals of your specific projects. This includes methods and expected outcomes. This is a reflection of your research choice and practice. Right, so this 
third um, reason for what an abstract represents, I want it to be very personal. And so it is the researcher. Ultimately, at the end of the day, your abstract represents you. An abstract represents your journey and your goals. It represents yourself as a student or as a researcher and allows you to highlight points in your research and journey that you consider important, the points within your research that you consider to be game-changing. So ultimately, it is a representation or extension of not only what you do, but who you are as well to a certain degree. Okay, so how do we compile an abstract? There are about five to six major steps I've included for you to really get through abstract writing. Um, you'll see that I've given you all the information on the screen. So I'm going to be reading it just a little bit, unpack where I can, but it's very straightforward, hopefully. So the first thing you're going to start off is with an introduction. Describe what topic your paper covers. This really gives you context within the discipline. It allows different researchers to know what time period you're possibly working in, what region you're working in. The introduction provides what I call context right? It situates your audience into exactly where, when, and how we're approaching the specific research. So it provides the reader with a background to the study and presents the main idea of the paper. You need to avoid unnecessary content in your introduction. It needs to be the easiest, most straightforward, I would say, section of your abstract. You're then going to move on to what we call problem statements. You will have done this uh, in your um, sort of writing uh, tutorials in undergrad, or you are currently doing it in postgrad with your supervisors. But really, why are we doing the research is what a problem statement is. It is identifying a problem or something within the particular specialization you've opted for and saying this is the reason why something needs to change or why something needs to be done. It's identifying a problem ultimately that needs to be fixed or amended to a certain degree. So state the problem you're tackling. What's the key research question? Again, try do this in a very simple one or two sentences. Tell us what the goal of your research is. Significance of contribution is really the third aspect of your abstract. You're going to want to unpack quite a bit. This is where you summarize why nobody else has adequately answered the research question yet. So when we look at problem statement, you're identifying a problem or an area where something can be done better or looked at in a different perspective within your research specialization. <clears throat> Significance of contribution really highlights why it's a problem. Have methods not been applied correctly? Are there new methods that should be applied? Why has no one else met the sort of methodology or standards that you yourself feel your research is going to contribute towards. It really emphasizes the gap in the literature or in the data or in the research. So you could use a phrase such as, previous work has failed to address so-and-so. This research will apply these methodologies in order to fill this gap in knowledge uh, for not only myself, but also the broader community of heritage studies or archaeology, whatever it may be. So really, you identify a problem and then you explain why it is a problem to begin with and how you're hoping to fix the problem. This ties very closely into your next sentence or few sentences, which is, how is your approach significant? 
Explain how you tackle the research question. What's your big idea or change that can be applied? In other words, what is new, different or important about how you approach your research versus how others have approached the same research questions or research specializations? This gives you a wonderful opportunity to really start laying out the major academic foundations of your abstract. And that's very much linked to your methodology. What methods, what practice are you contributing? How did you go about doing the research that follows your approach? How did you apply your approach? Provide a brief outline of the methods you use or your practice. Did you run experiments, for example? Did you carry out case studies? All these need to be included very briefly in one or two sentences. And then we have, very excitingly, the outcomes of results. So this is typically one or two sentences as well. It depends on where in the writing process you yourself are, right? Because you may be applying to a conference or a workshop, but may have not necessarily completed your abstract. For that reason, the section may be quite smaller, but you may be able to make assumptions or predict outcomes based off of the information you do have. So really important, outcomes of results may not always, or outcomes or results, may not always indicate the bigger picture of your results. Sometimes all you can do is present the limited results you may have. Present the main findings of the paper, specifically the most important findings. Um, results or outcomes of your research can be included, including descriptive statistics or significant data. You do not need to include all your data and all your results. Merely the most important data is the data that should be included. The most important insights or inferences that you're able to make should really bring uh, your abstract to a conclusion ultimately. If you are still busy with your research, you can state that too. Or if completed, include once again your significant outcomes. So there are three major types of abstract formats. I'm not saying that there are three major types of abstract formats in the world. No, typically there are, depending on what um, discipline you're working in, there may be a range of different types of abstract requirements and abstract formats. But because we're looking particularly within a sort of archaeological heritage studies um, practitioning kind of uh, community, we're looking at three major abstract formats. The first is very straightforward, um, introduction, method, results, analysis, and discussion. Remember, you want to write about one to two sentences on each of these topics. The second abstract format is a little more complicated. So it includes research questions or hypotheses, theoretical frame, framework underpinning the questions or hypotheses. The third option you have is methods used to address the research question. And fourth, the results of the investigation. And the fifth point, under abstract format two is conclusions, applications, and implications or limits to one's research. Now, typically, if we're looking at abstract two, you can already assume, hopefully by now, that one would require a very extensive, or apologies, not extensive, just a very high um, abstract word count in order for us to unpack all these details. Format one requires a very general um, abstract uh, word count, something slightly lesser, potentially 100 to 150 words, would be easily covered um, in format one. Format two, certainly we're looking at 150 to about 300 words. 
Format 3 includes context, research questions, aims, summary of content and methods, and significant conclusions or outcomes. I quite personally like Abstract 3. I think it provides a really good background to your abstract, really allows the audience to hone in on which region, which period we're dealing in with, what data we're looking at, and then we can unpack slowly the kinds of methods we um, employed. So I've given you an example of an abstract of mine that is quite a few years old, but nonetheless, what I've done is I've opted for, uh, or naturally I wrote it as formatting three, which is context, research questions, aims, summary of content, methods, conclusion, and significance. So I won't be reading the abstract out because I think it would be taking up a significant amount of time that I don't have, unfortunately. But what I have done for you is I have color coded these various parts of my abstract so you can correlate them to Format 3's breakdown. So, very generally, when we look at context, I've provided the regional locations for this particular study, provided not only site names, but also the broader region we're going to be looking at. I've let you know exactly which species I am looking at, that of modern humans, and I let you know the period we're based in, which is um, pushing this location specifically pushing into the Middle Stone Age. The second option we're looking at is research questions. So to understand the roots of these adaptations which occur in the Middle Stone Age, um, I've opted to really unpack why it's important to investigate this period. This ties very closely into my PhD research questions because it's really this area that's been quite, I wouldn't say neglected, but not as extensively researched as other locations uh, for early Middle Stone Age, late early Stone Age material. Summary of contents and methods, I let you know exactly what methods I'm applying and why. For example, this research project will focus on conducting a multidisciplinary, fine resolution, stratigraphically sensitive study of sites on the coastal platform in the Southern Cape. What's really nice about um, abstracts is that they force you to be very specific and meaningful with the words you use. Um, it also forces you to practice writing and saying um, various statements in the most efficient way as possible. And then of course I introduce some conclusions of why this model is important and what some major insights may be with regards to it. So this is just a nice example of how an abstract would look. Benefits of writing a strong abstract. So the first thing you should always consider is networking. Networking is not something just for those in the highest positions in academia and research. Not at all. Networking is something that you're doing right now by watching this. Networking is something you're doing by engaging in different content and different organizations and peers, such as SASC uh, and the Southern African Archaeological Student Society. It provides you with the opportunity to learn from other people, potentially teach other people, but most importantly, make really major connections that could lost your entire career or your entire research uh, career at least. So you're able to make connections that may in the future be of great benefit or at present time may open opportunities for you that you previously were unaware of. This pushes straight into the next point, which is collaboration. There is no easier way to learn and grow your knowledge and 
grow your skills and capabilities than collaborating. For all the information we know, people around us know just as much on different topics and specializations, all of which are positive. It represents a positive opportunity in which we can collaborate. And what you'll find in SDWs, which you're doing right now, and with workshops and conferences, is that sometimes bringing information together and bringing methods from different disciplines together creates a very, very strong research project, um, research sort of protocol. And ultimately, it also represents how you're going to write your abstract. So an abstract allows you to open yourself up to collaborators. It really is almost like um, an advert for yourself and your research. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is my great idea. And these are my methods I'm applying. Do you feel that perhaps we have something in common? Perhaps we don't have something in common, but you'd like to create something that my change, an entire specialization. So collaboration, very important. All of this is, of course, that of knowledge sharing. Projects, information, knowledge systems are constantly growing. Um, and it is our job and ultimately our responsibility to make sure that we open ourselves up to as much knowledge as possible so that we can do as good of a job as possible with our own research and goals, ultimately. So very quickly, what are the qualities of a strong abstract? So it needs to be presented as a single, coherent and concise paragraph. It uses an introduction, body, conclusion, structure, very similar to the three formats I provided you earlier on. It adds no new information that is not included in your research or project already. It is a summary of what you already have. It can be understood without individuals having to read your paper, your research proposal, or any of the broader academic sort of documentations associated with your work. It must be very easily understood immediately. It provides a condensed and concentrated version of your broader, bigger projects. It does not contain um, abbreviations or acronyms unless they have been defined. It doesn't contain citations or extensive background information. That's why you have your other types of formats, such as your research proposal or your thesis dissertation, your publication writing, for example. An abstract is not a place for extensive background information does not contain any sort of illustration, figure, or table, or reference to them. So again, this is an original piece of work that you're able to summarize based on your own current research projects um, or goals, ultimately. So before we end off, I did not want to leave you empty-handed. On the screen, you're looking at um, two very good publications on abstract writing. So I know how tedious that might sound. You're now having to read publications to understand how to write an abstract. But I thought it was really important. It might be more clearly uh, unpacked for you and will provide you a lot more information than, of course, I've been able to in this uh, lecture or the session so far. So please do look at these readings when you're able to and let me know if they've helped you in any way. Thank you all so much and happy abstract writing. I have full confidence in all of you and remember if you have any questions all you have to do is ask. Everyone here is here to help you and help you be as best of a version of yourself as possible. Have a wonderful day or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And yeah, bye.